Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why data science sometimes doesn't work. Um, I know you guys, some of you may notice the reference to the Robert Frost poem about making decisions here, the road not taken, uh, can be interpreted in many ways. I like the interpretation of regretting inaction. So we are not omniscient agents, as uh, many of you know. We do not know the actual outcome of our actions. And our environment is not fully observable. So information gathering, exploration, and learning are what a rational agent needs to do. People think of data science or data scientists as people that know the answers or they're going to have to figure it out. Um, so part of the fallacy here is that there is no failed data science project. Uh, and there probably is no data science project that worked. <laughs> um, but there is no project where we did not learn. Uh, so I'm going to have an emphasis in this dis discussion around what we've learned about our data, our operations, and our abilities to work as a team to deliver. Um, so today we're going to discuss how we can improve. Let's jump to that. Um, sorry, I have to click on two machines. Uh, so. First, I'm going to introduce myself, even though Angela did a great job. And then we're going to jump into an exercise on experts. And I would really like some audience participation. Um, we will talk about how an individual can grow in a data science-focused world and how we can emphasize value when delivering projects. Um, if there is time, I'd love to answer questions, but not hard ones. <laughs> no. Um, OK, so really quickly, who am I? Um, Constant Impact is a boutique consulting firm focused on delivering high-value end-to-end machine learning projects in the energy space with a small team of hand-picked experts. My name is Gibby. I'm a director of Constant Impact, and my role is to run effective teams that deliver constant incremental value with custom data-driven solutions. OK, so today we're going to talk about the intersections of domains across energy and technology, uh, even though in John's discussion earlier, he said it's probably not going to work. Um, and we're going to discuss how we can tie the smaller pieces together to get closer to a global maximum. Uh, this simple graphic, you're going to see a lot of hieroglyphics today, uh, so bear with me. So this simple graphic expresses what I'd like to emphasize today. On the left-hand side, you have the focus on an individual expert then we come together as a team. It's working and collaborating. Uh, and then as a team, we deliver value, hopefully. Um, so as we get jumping on this expertise section, um, we're going to get to know the audience better. So as a practice in raising hands, please, for my benefit, so I can see how interesting this actually is, um, how many people in the audience develop or review code? Okay, that's great. Um, how many of you have developed or reviewed code in the last month? This is really good. Um, how many of you have written a unit test in the last month? Oh, perfect. That's the answer I wanted. <laughs> um, of the people who just raised their hands, um, how many of you had a degree in computer science? OK, so the computer scientists are writing unit tests. <laughs> um, OK, so this has been really helpful. And the next four slides, we're going to show some terms uh, that an expert in their field would recognize. The slides will cover uh, engineering applications in energy, mathematical modeling, and technology to specifically operationalize machine learning as well as another slide that talks about the features of a great teammate. You will notice I'm staying away from HPC terms. My assumption was you guys were all already experts in that. Um, so here we go. Okay, so With a show of hands, have you in your work experience made decisions, big or small, to use or not, apply or not apply any of the terms shown here? Um, as a hint, uh, you know, this, the, you should see seismic imaging. Yeah. This is energy space related. So I'm hopeful that the kind of concept here is that across the 100 engineering disciplines, some of you have made decisions around this. Seems like only three of you. Okay, a couple more of you. Um, that's good. Then we have the next slide. Um, who considers themselves an expert at mathematical modeling? And you are 
And you don't have to be bashful and be like, I'm not an expert. Um, if you're working with these terms, if people are counting on you to answer anything in the field of mathematical modeling, then we would consider you an expert here. Um, it's very few experts at this conference today. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I mean, it's hard to put all math terms on one slide. Um, going with the next one, uh, in order to create a digital solution to any of the problems just shown on the previous two slides, we need to be thinking about the fields of data ops and ML ops. Who considers themselves an expert in deploying data and, or analytical solutions? The same people are experts at a lot of things, guys. <laughs> um, which is totally OK. Um, all right, so what's? OK, so now, who considers themselves an outgoing, talkative person and a great teammate? Uh, that's good, that's the right attitude, because if you just have one piece of this, we're gonna be successful. Um, so not everyone can be everything, and you need to find the things that you like and the workarounds that work for you. Um, so in the next slide here, uh, we've got a, and this is my biggest spelling mistake, guys. That's not how Aries is spelled, I'm sorry. I, I had a feeling it was wrong, and then I just showed it to my sister, and she is an Aries, and she was like, yeah, that's definitely wrong. Um, okay, so I'm not great at spelling. Um, but one of the things that we want to talk about when we talk about what is data science is how broad it is, right? It's really leveraging a toolkit to solve a problem. Sim similarly to how you're going to write a math problem to solve uh, you know, a, a, a problem that you're seeing in the real world, um, we're just gonna kind of do that again, but with more confusing different buzzwords. Um, so a talk that I gave at Rice last year was uh, about knowing what you don't know. Uh, I think that's pretty important as you're a data scientist. There's an expectation or a nervousness that you maybe should have learned something. Um, and I know in my academic career, I got really good at the things that my professors were good at, um, and I didn't get good at the things that they weren't good at because it didn't come up as often. Uh, so one of the nervousness that students has, students have when they go to you know, further academic experiences or professional experiences is that uh, if they don't know something, they should stay quiet and pretend that they already know it. Um, what I have noticed is that some people have a natural inclination to do one part of the pipeline. Um, they're interested in certain parts of it, and you know, I kind of as a joke, we'll call it your horoscope, but it's where you would lean to even if someone wasn't pushing you. Um, so I'm a Libra, um, and Libras like balance, apparently, so I gave myself the A-B testing expert. Um, there are uh, some, <laughs> my favorite is the Taurus, who's kind of stubborn, um, so he's never gonna leave R. He will not learn Python ever for any reason. <laughs> um, but you know, these are extremes. Uh, and this is more to kind of level set that even within your expertise, there is work that you gravitate towards doing. And um, you spend a lot of your day at work. So f liking the things that you do and finding out what you like is very important. Um, and then being on a team and being able to identify the people that will help with the broader end to end is also really important. Right, so I may not write the cleanest code, but if there is that person on the team that does, he's gonna help elevate all of our code. I might not want to do unit tests, but if there is someone on the team that does, he's going to help enforce that we at least have more. Um, so keeping that balance is, is very important. Uh, you don't want a whole bunch of people that are all really, really good at one thing. Um, here we go, okay. So now we're gonna talk about growing into a better teammate. Um, so as John mentioned, this is gonna, you know, some of the challenges that are coming to rely on an unreliable energy source are going to require a lot of creativity, a lot of teamwork, and a lot of in a interdisciplinary work. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what you can do to be more effective and communicate better together. Um, okay, so. There's a lot of buzzwords in this field. Um, sorry, my 
other slide got out of whack here. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the difference between knowledge and skills and why it's important to know what your neighbor is doing. Um, according to the internet, knowledge is like having the recipe for a cake. A skill is actually being able to make the cake with that recipe. Uh, so if we have a problem that we're observing in nature, we can use mathematics to create a problem or a solution for it. And now we can use technology to help us use our mathematics. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of tools uh, relating to, you know, I, I, you know, more skills that we had before. So in university, I didn't learn any of the languages that I'm using today. Um, I think that's probably true for, for some of the people here. So how do you keep yourself pushing and how do you keep yourself relevant? The other aspect is going to be around befriending your neighbor. Um, if you don't know what everyone else is doing, if you've never sat down with them, if you've never had a conversation with them, uh, then you're probably going to be defensive and angsty. And when you're on a call and they correct you, you're going to hate them and talk about it in your diary. Um, and we want to get you away from that. So taking the time, especially in a more virtual world, to actually have a coffee with your coworker and not talk about work um, will help you see them as real people. And that way, when they say something that upsets you on a call, you're going to be less defensive around it. Um, so uh, that's going to take us to an element of self-awareness. Uh, do you feel comfortable talking about things that you don't like or that you're not good at? So for example, um, I always liked vectors. I always liked matrices. And I always hated trees. It's like pruning them, talking about them, going halfway down them, splitting them. I never really liked them at all. And when I think about my work and I think about when I was gravitating towards a problem, I always stayed away from computer science because in my mind, they loved trees. Um, and everything, their directory, everything is structured around kind of this visual that my brain didn't like to go down. Um, so it was always important to me to think about you know, where, where I like to do things and then how I could be less defensive around not wanting to learn that you know, new, new skill or new topic. Um, so it's really important to be aware that it's the combination of knowledge and skills that are going to make you valuable. Um, so it's not just knowing how to, to make the cake. It's knowing how to work in a team, knowing how to collaborate, learning GitHub, learning Docker, learning how to use the tools that have been created in order for you to display your knowledge and leverage your knowledge. Um, so on the right-hand side, and this is important because I've been asked a lot about, you know, you've got all these domain specialties and reservoir engineering, uh, meeting data science, and kind of what people need to do and what they can learn. Um, I tried to stay, uh, I try to say uh, more, I guess, vague around that, um, and say they kind of have to be very self-aware. You have to know what it is that you don't know, and you have to know what's valuable to your organization or what's valuable to the market. So on the right-hand side, you're going to see a uh, uh, three-dimensional plane. On the top, we've got a runner. So that's the things that you're really good at. You're winning there. You're going to beat all of your friends at that. On the left-hand side, there's going to be things that are hard to do, right? And then on the right-hand side, it's things that in the Jenga. What, what skill is going to be valuable with your unique combination for your uh, organization, right? So if everyone on your team knows how to do something, is it super valuable for you to learn that? Well, it is, if that's how you're going to collaborate. But if that's not a means that you guys are using to collaborate, then you kind of want to go and learn something that they all don't already know how to do. So if you think about that intersection of reservoir engineering and big data, um, what would make you valuable? What tools do you need to learn there to do both that either your team doesn't know or your organization doesn't know? Um, and then your unique combination of skills uh, is, is going to make people want you on their team. Um, and yeah, I actually have a little note here. Most importantly, <laughs> you have to do the work. <laughs> um, so these are pretty slides, but you really you know, have to write down a, a ton of, uh, of, 
uh, features and tools and uh, technologies that you yourselves, are, you yourself aren't good at or that you want to practice or that you need to learn and sort of go, go and do it again. So here, um, okay, so this slide is after you've had your virtual coffee chats for 15 minutes and you know everyone that's working on your pipeline, um, how do you explain to someone else what they do? Uh, and on the left-hand side here, I say, you know, you should be able to explain it to your college course mate. And I use that expression because sometimes people are like, how would you explain it to your mom? And I find that very offensive as a mom. <laughs> um, so how would you explain it to your college course mate? Do you guys, show of hands, anyone here have friends in college? <laughs> while they were in, no, while they were in college, did you have another friend who was in college? <laughs> Only a few of you. Okay, that tracks. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there is, you know, an expectation that you guys at least learn the same things. Even if your professional history went differently, you should be able to have a drink with that guy or girl and explain to him what you're doing and what the other people on your team are doing and why that's valuable. Um, and if you can't, you're in trouble and on the right hand side, you're gonna see your project and your product is not gonna work. Um, so if you don't know what your DevOps team, for example, is doing, high likelihood they're building something that's not for you, right? And uh, that's gonna be a big issue. Was the, there was a different hieroglyphic that I didn't pick, which was the car, they didn't have the windshield. Um, and you know, it's about the teams not talking together. So if you can't explain to someone that was your college course mate, how Docker relates to your job, then something's probably not working. Um, and I don't think you should have to explain the inner workings of you know, a YAML script, but I do think you need to be able to explain what problem it's solving and how that problem relates to your work. Um, even on the sales side, I don't know if there's uh, anyone here on the sales side, but I sometimes see you know, there's a, a lack of interest in understanding the non-functional features of your product. And if you are out there trying to sell it, you're not going to be able to nuance why your product is, uh, is valuable to them. And as an organization, you've invested in those people working on that solution together with you. So um, if they're there, they're not just a warm body doing nothing, right? They should be building something that is impacting what you're doing. Um, so this might be my favorite slide. Um, this is uh, the importance of a contribution guide. And I love this slide because we're gonna talk about how computer scientists have created a entire language and way of working and way of being on teams that requires them never having to speak to each other. Um, and that's really, really important. It's really important today in 2023 when a lot of us don't wanna to speak to each other and we're all online. They've created this universe where all of their work is completely consumable. And it is because they, well, they work hard to write something that they're never gonna to have to answer any questions about. Um, and because there's all these other little tricks in there, a, a, uh, a standardization that has allowed them to contribute to each other's work. And I think a lot of the times we'll see, I'm gonna use the reservoir engineer example, um, where you are writing code, right? But you're not, you're not writing it for someone else to consume. And technology was originally, you know, software is created for someone else to use. And uh, a lot of people don't view the code that they develop daily as software, right? They think it's just for their own personal use, right? They created it and then they're going to create uh, a beautiful uh, LaTeX presentation about the results of it um, and nobody will ever look at their code or recycle their code or reuse their code. And um, software engineering philosophy have allowed computer scientists to scale their work take each other's pieces, wrap up some other elements of work. And when you're talking about an enterprise that has finicky solutions, maybe they have finicky HPC solutions, and nobody is creating wrappers or recycling the work to make it more effective for others to use, it's not, it's not great. Um, so when I mention a contribution guide here, I'm gonna say 
if you're not using things and you don't think it's valuable to learn how a linter works, what static analysis tools you need to run, you know, are you framing your repository with semantic versioning? Are you using PEP? Do you have any PRs? Do you have auto documentation? Has anybody reviewed your code? And do you have a unit test? If you're thinking those things aren't important to you, then your work is not going to be widely used. But if you start to use and adopt this, you know, very special language that software engineers have created for themselves to al allow for collaboration, then your work is gonna get recycled, it's gonna get reused, and you're gonna be able to do cooler stuff. Um, I also recommend having a discussion board, right? Be prepared to have your work discussed. That's going to get it improved. And um, most people are nice, especially if you have a virtual coffee chat with them first. Um, so I think that's pretty important. Um, and then for the experts that want their work to be more widely used, these skills are gonna give you more visibility. Did anyone here contribute to an open source library today? A few of you. A lot of the ones that were doing unit tests. I like it, guys. Um, and I don't know if I, I've got it here, um, but one of the reasons I love unit tests is because it tells me, and I don't know if you guys care, but it tells me that you sat down, you thought about how this is gonna work, and we talk about machine learning, I hear it all the time. How do I unit test it? I don't need to unit test it, you know, it's a clustering algorithm, what would I unit test? And um, then what are you proving? Why are you using it? What is its accuracy going to do to help you? Does it even mean anything? Because if you're not willing to spend oh, probably an hour, an hour of your time to figure out if it works, uh, then you're gonna lose a lot of trust. Nobody is gonna wanna reuse your work. It's gonna be hard for you to contribute. Um, and I don't know, I won't like you as much. <laughs> um, okay, so here we have uh, the next slide and that's gonna be around delivering together as a team. Um, so we've talked about how teams can grow together and now we're gonna discuss the importance of establishing a baseline around your work. Um, so, and I can say, I can slice this a lot of different ways, um, but there's two t broad types of problems that we can solve. One is an established problem and one is a potential opportunity. Um, there's a lot of pros to the established problem, right? The organization is set up to consume the solution. Um, it requires a lot of subject matter expertise. Um, you're gonna run into a problem if you continue to solve this problem, but the solution has stopped adding value. Um, and again, kind of the road not taken in the beginning, a lot of the times you don't wanna leave that problem because um, you love it. Uh, so on the right-hand side, um, we've got a new opportunity, I'm probably gonna do it wrong, lots of organizational change, a couple of people might quit. Um, it's gonna be a simpler solution, so less fun for experts, uh, and it's probably gonna have more gains, more upside if it does work. So if I talk a little bit around what that's gonna look like, uh, the headline here is do you have a quantified expected business value? So if you're going to keep talking about your model accuracy and your pull requests are related to model accuracy, I'm wondering why we're still doing it. Um, is, is there going to be a non-functional upside, upside, right? Where things are going to be faster, right? Your latency will improve. Um, or do you just love this problem and you don't wanna move away from it? And that could be valid, right? Um, there could be opportunities for you to apply that same methodology, sorry. Um, but, but maybe not, maybe to a place that needs the business value more. Um, on the kind of, in the legend here, um, in an established problem, we're not gonna see a ton of uh, pull requests related to a runtime environment, related to monitoring, right? It's just these pink, these pink boxes are the ones that we're going to see change. Um, I think that's important because when you're looking at a mature existing solution, you've got a clear end-to-end -end pipeline, you have an established architecture, it's highly specialized. Um, your operations are well run. So if you improve your model, nothing, you know, nothing downstream is really gonna have to change with you. Uh, but 
is there still value in solving this? Um, and are you, every time you submit a pull request, are you thinking about that? Is it quantified somewhere? Um, and is it, it, could you explain the value to your you know, old college roommate? So. Then we have the potential opportunity. You're gonna notice a lot of pink boxes here. Um, this is risky work, right? Uh, the amount of work that needs to get done here, the project architecture that needs to get built, you're working across disciplines, you're working with uh, different people in uh, different time zones. Uh, there's gonna be a heavy ML ops component, there's going to be heavy domain and end user knowledge. Uh, your data is gonna be wrong. Your software engineer is gonna have no idea that your data is wrong because they don't know what geophysics is at all, right? Um, so it's just gonna take a ton of communication. And if you're not interested in growing those skills, then you're gonna have a big issue. And if your code is not modularized in a way that we can start to borrow from existing solutions, then you're just, what, creating all of this end-to-end -end by, you know, uh, on, on your own, or you've got one one person who probably studied one part of this trying to build the whole thing, um, it's not gonna work. Uh, and you exhaust yourself and it makes it look like data science doesn't work, right? So being able to recycle these pipeline pieces, being able to understand your project architecture, being able to have a good relationship with your domain experts um, are essential in order to uh, do this cross-disciplinary work that John is worried about. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but we do have time for questions. But only ones I can answer. It's important. I think we should, you know, let's ask hard ones. <laughs> my name, you can ask me my name again. <laughs> so you guys understood everything? You're good? <laughs> They're experts. Thank you for the inspiring words. Uh, kind of depressing. Why? <laughs> Why? What was depressing? Because you just have to learn you, how to use you a linter. All these components and the people all need to do the right thing for the final product to succeed. What's the range of uncertainty? So to say, how, how do you manage non-performance of an individual or a group in this long chain? Uh. How do you measure non-performance of an individual or a group? Um, so, I mean, I think it's pretty critical that within a project, right, if you're looking at the components that you need to build something, um, and let's say you have a DevOps engineer on the team, um, if it is not clear to you know everyone in the Scrum, for example, how their work is supporting what you're building, um, and that'll either be because they're not getting it done in a time frame that seems reasonable to, uh, to, to, to people that have experienced it before, um, or uh, it is not understood what they're doing. Um, so if you've got pull requests, you've got a unit of work that within two weeks, nobody knows how it helps your project, um, then you've got a problem. And I think at a larger level, um, you'll see that from a group perspective when you're investing in a project, you're seeing all of these you know, lines of code written and you don't see them associated with a value. And I mean literally associated, right? So with all of our new tools that our software engineer friends have made for us, you can you know, assign any unit of work a value and uh, you should be able to aggregate all of that and get a sense of if that code was, was helping you and helping your users. Did that answer your question, Della? Kind of. Halfway. Halfway? What's the other half? Who, who makes that decision whether it was successful or not? Are you advocating a crowdsourcing model for management and success? So um, are who are the stakeholders of your project? So, open source, right? So open source community handles this kind of as a crowdsourcing model, right? Is there a disagreement? Is there a big discussion? So there's 
There's, I guess, okay, so there's two ways that you could look at it. One is you have the, the success of the, the piece of code that was developed and more widely used within your organization, right? And that could be more of that, you know, crowdsource perspective, right? Uh, you contributed, other people used it, it was clear, you know, you've got, you know, one metric is that, okay, that project didn't really work, right? But that piece of code lived long. Right? Lots of people learn from it. We can track the lineage of it and the dependencies of it other places in our organization. The other is uh, that piece of code might not have worked because the project didn't work. Right? That's nobody's fault. Part of it is writing it down. What expectation did you have? Did its unit test fulfill it? Right? At the end of two weeks, did you have other stakeholders agree that you know, the data in and the data out added value? Well, then it gets a check mark. Right? Even if the broader project didn't work, that unit of code should still be associated with, um, you know, some tangible results. I kind of have a question. Um, how does, uh, like, if your team is, you know, the size of seven versus the size of 70, like, how do you... Oh, I don't like big teams. Um, but I, I don't like big teams especially if we go back to that last one, because you never really are going to work all together at the same time, right? So um, I don't know how to go back, guys. Um, so when, when I look at this slide and there's so much to do, there's still four people, right, um, at, at one time, right? Because once one part of it is built, they don't really need to be on the team anymore, right? Or at least their role within the team is changing. So an element of it is what, and also, you don't you require a different level of expertise. If I just need to get something going, right? That's very different than when you know now I'm, you know, two years down the line, and we're going to have different people make it actually better. But those are the same people that probably wouldn't have been on it to begin with. Do you have an upper limit of how how big you would build the team? Um, I, I would. Okay, so it depends on how many people like are 100 percent on it. Mm -hmm. I'd say. If you have people that are dedicated 20% and less, and they're still in your sprint meetings, and your team has grown to 35 people, you've 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 reached your upper limit. Okay. Eight eight feels good. Fifteen feels like a lot to manage because just like I said, you have to you have to understand if everyone's work is adding value. And once it gets so big, it's so hard to sit through there and and you know assign that task and assign that work to, um, to, to material business value. I have a question for you guys, because that's what she does. Um, how big are your teams, the, the people that are HPC managers? Six? It's a good team. Hmm? Eight to 15. Eight to 15? Okay. So usually you guys stop at 15, okay. And along, along a project, you might have more. And my favorite is you get a lot of people to train, right? So it's more like bring a friend. <laughs> you had 15, next thing you know, you have 30, and everyone's kind of working together. I would say I also, though, would put, uh, I probably wouldn't do more than like eight stories. So I, even if your team is getting bigger, a lot of people are working on subtasks under a story. Um, they're not. You shouldn't have that many units of work <laughs> happening. You should have a lot of training happening as well. Well, any questions? I can see some in behind me. So uh, one thing that I find challenging as an engineering manager is uh, in the field of HPC, you get a lot of extreme specialization um, and so when when you're developing a software team and you're trying to uh, uh, grow the team's skills uh, I find that it's important to try to uh, connect people that have the specialized skills and spread their knowledge as they're developing it to other people who don't have that knowledge um, but I always find that that's a struggle to try and get things done in a timely manner. So how would you suggest 
tackling that? Yeah, so it's really not a sexy answer. You have to write a list of everything that you want everyone to know, right? And you have to have your experts write, a, like, write down a list of topics that they use weekly, monthly, right? And then, you know, it excels with a column. How many people have upskilled in this topic, right? How can we help them upskill? How can we continue to track this? So if I got 15 people in my team and I know that there's this right combination, or not at least better combination of you know their perspective learning a new skill, right? Um, how can you track however, and we consider it units, right? Like there's 30 skills for you to learn this year, or 30 specialties that your different experts have. Um, have you made any movement on them? And what we used to do is you rank yourself from one to five, right? And you'd be like, I went from a two to a four, right? And um, actually having the discipline to make it a little bit more data driven, that also gives the team the ability when they're talking about uh, their successes through the year, right? They can say tangibly, you know, I wasn't doing, you know, nothing. I might have been on one or two projects that didn't work out, but also look how I've learned this other set of tools and these other skills. Well, Gibby, I want to thank you for being here. She thank will you. be here at the reception. <laughs> Thanks, guys.